talking resistance, don't you? Among other things. And he said, why don't you use some of this money for that purpose? And as I described to you before we took recess, I thought it was a right good idea. And I came back and advocated it, and we did it. Even Gorbanifar knew that you were supporting the Contras. Yes, he did. His Vestia knew it. The name had been in the papers in Moscow. It had been all over Danny Ortega's newscast. Radio Havana was broadcasting it. It was in the, every newspaper in the land. All our enemies knew it, and you wanted to conceal it from the United States Congress. We wanted to be able to deny a covert operation. The Iran-Contra hearings of 1987 raised disturbing questions about the conflicts between secrecy and democracy. How can a society harbor in its midst secret arms of government? Why did these agencies come to be? What do we really know about what they do? And how do they protect us, fail us, sometimes threaten us? These are not really new questions. Similar ones have been raised throughout this century a century in which the United States has created a vast intelligence empire, an empire both foreign and domestic, supported by billions of dollars and layer upon layer of government. In the skies, dazzling spy machines have helped avert global war. There have been secret agents and secret warriors who have changed the destinies of nations. It is a secret empire that serves as America's eyes and ears, its shield, and sometimes its sword. But the U.S. intelligence community has evolved to a level where it has the potential of threatening the very principles it was created to defend. It is this constant tension between secrecy and democracy that we wish to explore, seeking the answer to perhaps the most important question of all. Who will watch the watchers? A warning as we begin, the journey through the world of secret intelligence is full of deception. But it is possible to trace the important role of U.S. intelligence in shaping the history of our country and the world in the 20th century. That is what our series intends to do. America at the turn of the century. Isolationist, prosperous, and protected by two oceans. It is a world with little need for espionage. There is no mention of secret arms of government in its constitution, now over a hundred years old. The United States will be the last of the great powers to create an intelligence agency. Such was the mindset of the U.S. towards espionage as late as 1916. Even though war had been raging in Europe for two years, America entered the war in 1917 wholly unprepared in intelligence matters. When General Peyton March became chief of staff, he found that his entire intelligence department consisted of two officers and two clerks. This was not the case in Russia, a nation torn apart by civil war. Bolshevik leader Vladimir Lenin promised peace, land, and bread to the Russian masses. He seized power in November of 1917. The Bolsheviks made a separate peace with Germany, to the dismay of the Allies, who promptly invaded. The Allies hoped to strangle the infant Soviet state in its crib. It was an invasion force made up of Czechoslovaks, Poles, Japanese, the British, and over 13,000 American troops. 
Bolshevik power was also challenged by supporters of the Tsar and by a disaffected populace that believed the revolution was being betrayed. To wage war on the Soviet's military enemies, Lenin turned to his ablest associate, Leon Trotsky, who created the Red Army. To stamp out internal resistance, Lenin created what was called the Extraordinary Commission to Combat Counter-Revolution and Sabotage, the Cheka, forerunner to the KGB. All opposition was to be crushed. The Cheka's only rule was to win. It loosed mass unbridled terror. Anyone could be branded an enemy of the people. Thousands were arrested, imprisoned, tortured, and executed. The reign of terror, like the fight against foreign invaders, succeeded. Allied troops went home. The Soviet people were subdued. But protecting the revolution at home was only part of the Cheka's mission. Equally important was fomenting revolution abroad through military power, subversion, and espionage. Lenin convened the Third Congress of the Communist International in 1919. There, he predicted a world Soviet state by the next year. Lenin's bold prediction seemed possible. The Red Revolution surged out of Russia. Governments panicked everywhere. In the once isolationist United States, complacency was shattered by a tide of post-war labor unrest, unrest attributed to Red agitation. Across the nation, some four million American workers went out on strike. Blood flowed as police and private detectives battled workers. The unrest grew worse in April 1919, when 34 bombs in several cities were intercepted before reaching their intended victims, all public figures. A month later, however, a 35th bomb did explode on the steps of this Washington townhouse. Its intended victim was then U.S. Attorney General A. Mitchell Palmer. Palmer wasn't hurt. The bomb thrower was not so fortunate. He was killed. But in the debris, searchers found a leaflet signed by a group called the Anarchist Fighters. It threatened violence against the capitalist class. Palmer labeled the bombing the work of emissaries of the Bolshevik leader Lenin. It was all part of a secret communist plot, Palmer believed, to bring Lenin's revolution to America. The attorney general decided he would retaliate and crush the communist movement. All alien radicals were to be rounded up and deported. The stage was now set for the emergence of an obscure 24-year-old lawyer in the Department of Justice, J. Edgar Hoover. The young and energetic Hoover was placed in charge of the anti-radical campaign. He first surrounded himself with the writings of the Marxist pioneers. His strong convictions about communism were forged then and would serve as his model for the rest of his life. Hoover's first act was the deportation to Russia of 250 aliens accused of attempting to overthrow the United States government. To ensure no chance of a mutiny at sea, the ship also carried 200 soldiers. Hoover predicted that other Soviet arcs would soon set sail. Meanwhile, thousands of other accused radicals were arrested in a national roundup coordinated by Hoover. Some were beaten. Many were imprisoned without benefit of due process. One of those swept up in the raids was a young radical, Ella Wolf. They just put him in jail, you know, and, and the hysteria was incredible. Wherever you went, there was great hysteria. And uh, so, um, no matter where we uh, organized, there were the Palmer raids. And then two detectives came to take me to the district attorney's office. And when I walked in the first time, he said, first tell me, what does an educated, lovely young girl do with wasting so much time with these dirty, filthy foreigners? That was his first question. And I said, these are not dirty, filthy foreigners. These are friends of mine, and they are comrades. Although thousands were jailed, most went free. The accused radicals had violated no laws. The same could not be said 
for Hoover's Raiders. Very soon, the public became more outraged at the injustices that these detainees were suffering, more than the alleged danger that they posed to the United States. When Attorney General Palmer went on to predict that there would be a revolution on May 1st, 1920, and nothing happened, the Palmer raids ended up looking ridiculous. Hoover nearly lost his job. But Hoover survived the public backlash and in 1924 was named director of the Bureau of Investigation, which later expanded and became the FBI. Hoover would hold this position for almost half a century, serving under six presidents. In those years, the line between legitimate dissent and subversion would often blur. The civil liberties of Americans would be breached time and again. But for millions of Americans, Hoover was the defender of the American way of life. He protected the country against communists and gangsters, and he let the public know it was a carefully orchestrated image. Well, Jack, what do you got to say for yourself? I'm so short, I'll have to get up on the box. All right, Jack, on the box. Let us know what you know about crime, about the conditions in New York. Gee, Mr. Hoover, your G-men sure are good. I'd like to be one when I grow up. Well, if you work hard and play hard and live clean, you'll certainly be one. Thank you. Hoover's public relations savvy was surpassed only by his genius as a government bureaucrat. He established excellent relations with Congress, which approved his requests to build a first-rate crime laboratory. Hoover, who began his career as a Library of Congress messenger, now oversaw the compilation of the most extensive collection of fingerprints in the world. Today's FBI is a monument to its first director. As in the past, the FBI continues to pioneer in the use of science. State-of-the-art technology, like this laser beam examination of faint and very old fingerprints, is one of Hoover's legacies. Today, the Bureau's annual budget is more than a billion and a half dollars. It employs some 17,000 people who serve as the nation's protector in uncovering spies, blocking terrorism, and fighting crime. Taking on the underworld brought Hoover much of his early national attention. In the 20s and 30s, criminals were running wild in the nation, challenging government authority. Hoover declared war on these public enemies who were taking advantage of the lack of city, state, and federal police cooperation. We must not for a moment lose sight of our goal to teach the criminal that regardless of his subterfuges, his squirming, his twisting and slimy wriggling, he cannot escape the one inexorable rule of law enforcement. You can't get away with it. Despite Hoover's eventual long reign at the FBI, he had no assurance that he would be reappointed in 1932 when Franklin D. Roosevelt was elected president. My father distrusted Mr. Hoover very, very much. Uh, he felt that he was a great administrator and that he had done a good job or he wouldn't have kept him on. Besides the political uncertainty of a new administration, Hoover had an enemy, Roosevelt's wife, Eleanor. My mother disliked Mr. Hoover intensely and uh, disliked Mr. Hoover so to the extent that uh, she would vocally express her displeasure with Mr. Hoover and all of his works. Hoover kept an explosive dossier on Eleanor Roosevelt's private life, one of many such files the FBI director kept on key political figures in Washington. In 1943, the FBI submitted a report to the president suggesting that Eleanor was having an affair. FDR responded with anger. He threatened to send the FBI agents who had filed the allegations to the Pacific. There they would serve until killed by the Japanese. By the time Hoover sent these accusations to FDR, the FBI chief was secure in his job. 
Roosevelt may not have liked Hoover, but he needed him. In the late 30s, the nation was still at peace, once again isolationist and complacent in mood. But as war clouds gathered in Europe, there was only one man Roosevelt could turn to to provide domestic security against foreign espionage. As to an international intelligence service, none existed. In 1934, Roosevelt gave Hoover the assignment of surveilling potentially subversive groups in the United States, like these American Nazis in Madison Square Garden. The FBI's mission was expanded. Hoover was given responsibility for tracking down German agents throughout the Western Hemisphere, both prior to and during World War II. It was a struggle against enemy agents who had been sent to this country to disrupt our industries, destroy our morale, and damage the impact of our fighting armies. On May 26, 28, 1942, two German submarines left the base at Lorient. One landing on Long Island, the second landed in Florida. Four saboteurs landed from each submarine. They were well equipped with high explosives to create panic and insecurity in this country. The submarine saboteurs were in jail two weeks after they landed. Six of the eight were executed after a military trial. Again, Hoover played up the FBI's successes, but the wartime authority granted for the tracking down of German agents would be used by Hoover to conduct domestic surveillance for the next 36 years. Since Hoover had been directed to find out what groups had been infiltrated or were controlled by communists or fascists, logically, he had to investigate any organization that had a potential for infiltration. In practice, this meant that there was nothing to stop Hoover from investigating any organization to see if it was dominated by communists. If he came up with a negative finding, there was nothing to stop him from investigating the next year or the year after to see if some infiltration had subsequently taken place. But years before, Hoover's G-men were hunting down spies. An obscure operative was giving the United States its most important intelligence victories. He was Herbert Yardley, a brilliant pioneer in the secret craft of code breaking. Yardley's hobby became a profession in 1912 when he joined the State Department as a code clerk. He quickly showed his genius. One night, bored and with nothing else to do, he broke President Woodrow Wilson's own secret message code. Yardley knew that if he could break America's most important government code, other nations could also. After America's entry into World War I, he was put in charge of an Army cryptology unit, MI-8. Yardley demonstrated the military edge to be gained from breaking the enemy's electronic transmissions. MI-8 was dissolved after the armistice. But in the 1920s, Yardley received $100,000 from the government to form a clandestine decoding operation. It operated in absolute secrecy from this townhouse on East 37th Street in New York City. It was called the Black Chamber, and it had one mission, to steal and decipher as many foreign government communications as it possibly could get. One of the great problems that Yardley had was where he was going to get the material, the raw intercepts, the coded messages to solve because uh, radio was not in great use in those days, and he made an arrangement with a number of the cable companies to surreptitiously feed him these coded messages, which were, as I say, the raw material that he could use to break the codes of uh, Great Britain, France, possibly Germany, uh, many Latin American countries, and so forth. As an emerging global power, the United States now recognized the need for foreign intelligence. And the Black Chamber could provide it quickly, efficiently, and illegally. Yardley broke Japan's diplomatic codes in time for the intelligence to be used at an international naval disarmament conference in 1921. By reading Japan's cables, 
U.S. negotiators knew Japan's secret bargaining position. The Japanese diplomats found the Americans unusually stubborn at the conference table and quickly agreed to a ratio of battleships more favorable to the U.S. Yardley's black chamber would go on to break the codes of many other nations, but in 1929, the entire operation was shut down by Secretary of State Henry L. Stinson, who is said to have uttered, gentlemen do not read each other's mail. Yardley, who had suffered the loss of a finger on his right hand due to experiments with secret inks, was now bitter, out of work, and with a family to feed during the Depression. He wrote a book in 1931, revealing the secrets of the Black Chamber. The Japanese, upon reading the book, discovered their codes had been broken and promptly changed them. The U.S. government never forgave Yardley. Yardley died in 1958 and was buried here in Arlington National Cemetery. His true monument is not this stone, but the largest and most secret agency in the entire U.S. intelligence empire. That is the NSA headquarters, located in a 1,000-acre complex in Fort Meade, Maryland, about 25 miles from downtown Washington. It is highly secured. This is as close as we could get. But in those buildings is America's modern code-breaking effort and other eavesdropping systems as well. Today, the National Security Agency is probably five times the size of the Central Intelligence Agency and probably has about five times the size of the budget. It's an enormously large agency. Uh, at times, it's been upwards of 100,000 people when you count the civilians and the military uh, devoted to signals intelligence and code-breaking. Today, NSA eavesdrops on entire streams of communications. And those streams of communications, which may contain thousands of telephone calls, uh, are simply filtered through a computer that can be programmed with individual telephone numbers to target those numbers and listen to those phone calls. One of the NSA's earliest advisors was William Friedman, a man who took cryptology to new frontiers. Friedman was a genius at code breaking. When the Japanese altered their codes after Yardley's book, it was Friedman who, despite the enormous complexity of Japan's new codes, broke them once again. The highest uh, diplomatic cipher at the time um, was one known as Purple, the Purple Code. And William F. Friedman and his uh, small team, uh, was known as the SIS, the Signals Intelligence Service, were successful in uh, manufacturing or basically putting together almost an identical machine. The Japanese purple machine was a machine that put ordinary messages, sometimes in Japanese, sometimes in English. They sent messages in English into secret form so that a message you shall report might come out to be ZQVBLD and so forth. And at the other end, you would have to have a similar machine to take out the ZQVB and so forth and turn it into report. It did this in part by using telephone selector switches such as this. If you see, as this is pressed, a switch goes around. The way this would work in the machine was that if you were constantly pressing the letter A, for example, each time you press it, it would be enciphered into a different letter. At this position, A might be Q. At this position, A might be R. At this position, A might be L. And this constant changing was the principle of the purple machine, and you had to reconstruct something like this if you were trying to decipher it and solve it. The purple machine is still considered secret by the NSA, and the agency refused our request to film one. Only these rare photographs exist to suggest the immense difficulties faced in recreating a machine Friedman's team had never seen. It was one of the greatest intelligence coups of all time. But its product, which could have prevented a profound U.S. military defeat, was squandered. Nineteen forty marked the two thousand six hundredth anniversary of the founding of the Japanese Empire. Emperor Hirohito had chosen the word Showa, enlightened peace, to characterize his reign. But in greeting the new year, Japanese military leaders declared that the time had come for Japan to reject any who stood in the way of the nation. 
They meant primarily the other major Pacific power. The Japanese had a term for the U.S. presence, Tohayo no Gan, Cancer of the Pacific. Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto, commander of Japan's combined fleet, began planning a surprise attack on U.S. naval forces at Pearl Harbor. It would be a daring knockdown punch from which the United States would not recover. But the attack had to take place soon. Japan's stockpile of oil would only last about 18 months. While Yamamoto's Navy prepared for the attack, one of Japan's top spies under diplomatic cover in Hawaii began openly gathering intelligence critical to the success of the mission. Takeo Yoshikawa was a Japanese diplomat and a trained spy, and all he had to do was hire a cab and take a sightseeing trip. Yoshikawa took no photographs, he used no binoculars, and he broke no laws. The FBI and military intelligence were helpless to stop him. The hill surrounding Pearl Harbor gave Yoshikawa an excellent view of the disposition and movement of the U.S. fleet. What he freely observed and reported to Tokyo were two significant discoveries concerning schedules. First, the fleet was usually harborside on Sundays. Second, early warning U.S. patrol planes sent to patrol the waters around the islands never left before sunrise. Despite worsening U.S.-Japan tensions, complacency reigned in Honolulu. The U.S. military was all but asleep, lulled by pronouncements like this. A Japanese attack on Hawaii is the most unlikely thing in the world, with one chance in a million of being successful. That was how the Honolulu Star Bulletin assessed the situation on September 6th, 1941. Two months later, the Japanese Navy was at sea, observing strict radio silence. Meanwhile, Tokyo transmitted false signals to further hide Yamamoto's true position. Captain Alan Cole, a U.S. codebreaker, was stationed at Pearl Harbor. Two or three weeks preceding the attack on Pearl Harbor, uh, there was a game of hide-and-seek going on between our electronic surveillance and their ele electronic transmissions. They trying to convince us that nothing was going on, and we trying to find out what actually was going on. When Admiral Kimmel, who was the commander of the Navy at Pearl Harbor, asked his intelligence officer, uh, Commander Edwin T. Layton, where the Japanese fleet was located. Layton says, I do not know, sir. And Kimmel said, you mean they could be rounding Diamond Head at this moment? And Layton had to say to him, for all we know, they may. They might, because we do not know where they're located. U.S. naval codebreakers were confused by the false messages being transmitted by the Japanese Navy. They had lost track of the Japanese fleet. And they never received a message that said specifically, we will attack Pearl Harbor. Even so, three purple intercepts warned of an imminent, hostile Japanese attack somewhere in the Pacific. And any one of them should have galvanized the commanders here. Admiral Husband E. Kimmel and General Walter T. Short into action. They did not. They didn't because the commanders never received the intercepts. The codes were diplomatic, not military, and went instead to Washington. Government authorities there failed to transmit this intelligence back to Pearl Harbor. The first intercept asked the Japanese consulate to provide information based on an imaginary grid over Pearl Harbor. This would allow the Japanese Navy pilots to plot the exact position of each individual ship in its specific anchorage. Such intelligence would be of incalculable value in a bombing and torpedo attack. On December 2nd, a second message was intercepted. It ordered Japanese diplomats to burn their codes and destroy their code machines as well. This was a certain sign that the Japanese were planning to launch a major attack. On December 7th, yet another intelligence opportunity was squandered. 
A final Japanese dispatch, decoded in the early hours of December 7th, revealed that Japan had ordered its diplomats to break off negotiations with the United States at 1 p.m. Such an order for a precise time in the midst of a weekend was a sure sign of imminent attack. There were four hours left to act on the information. But by the time Washington did act, it was too late. The Japanese signal for attack, Tora, 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 had been given. Washington's warning, the most important intelligence in U.S. history, was delivered hours too late by an RCA telegram messenger, Tadeo Fuchikama. And I just delivered this usual to message same thing for Chester. And the funny thing is that nobody ever questioned me about my ancestry or anything. No problem. I kind of felt guilty that uh, maybe it was my fault uh, not delivering it quicker. But there wasn't anything I could do because the message came uh, late. Most of the Pacific Fleet and Air Force was destroyed. Amidst the destruction and confusion, over 1,000 men were wounded. 2,400 more were dead. Some 1,100 of those men, sailors and Marines, are entombed under the shrine where the U.S. battleship Arizona rests. It was a terrible price to pay. Although the Japanese had destroyed most of the Pacific fleet, they had overlooked a critical target that had been ripe for the taking. It proved to be Japan's most serious intelligence blunder of the war, a fact not known until the intelligence debriefing of the Japanese military leaders at the end of the war. I showed them a picture of the oh, one of those great still shots taken from an attacking Japanese plane of Battleship Row. And I said, you gentlemen all know this picture. Oh, yes, 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 they said. I said, do you know what those white circles are up in the top? And they said, sure, fuel tank farm on Oahu. I said, how many bombs did you drop there? They said, no bombs, not a target of attack. And I said, do you realize that all of the fuel oil the United States possessed west of the California coast was located above ground in those tanks? It did not occur to them that oil could be a critical factor to the United States, despite the fact that oil was the critical factor in their own timing of going to war. They had a one year's supply of fuel oil and uh, of oil in general, petroleum products. And it was that that caused the timing of the outbreak of the war. And yet, Thinking of the United States as Bay Koku, the wealthy country, it never occurred to them that we could be short of oil. The fact that America still had its oil would have been little consolation for the stunned and silent crowd that gathered in Times Square, New York, on the night of December 7th, 1941. They wanted to know, as did the entire nation, how such a surprise attack had happened. What had gone wrong? in the Pacific, and who was to blame.
General Short was harshly censured and relieved of his command. So was Admiral Kimmel, who at later congressional hearings attempted to defend his actions. We needed one thing, which our own resources could not make available to us. That vital need was the information available in Washington from the intercepted dispatches, which told when and where Japan would probably strike. I did not get this information. But another commander in the Pacific, Douglas MacArthur, despite derelictions before and after the attack, escaped criticism. MacArthur, who knew about the attack on Pearl Harbor and was informed of it as soon as it happened, made no movements. And there were a number that he could have made in order to ameliorate the Japanese attack eight hours later in the Philippines. There were those who think he should have attacked Japanese air bases in Formosa. Uh, the very least he could have done was to disperse his planes, and uh, he, he did neither of these. And what happened to MacArthur? Nothing. Uh, nothing derogatory. He became a hero. Why wasn't he vilified? Why wasn't he accused as Kimmel was? Because the United States, in addition to needing a scapegoat, also needed a hero, and MacArthur was handy to serve that role. The first wave was landed on schedule and had no opposition. Swell. Couldn't be better. But more than U.S. commanders were at fault. The worst intelligence failure in U.S. history was rooted in the lack of a centralized system to collect and disperse information. The United States government resolved it would never again be subject to surprise attack. By then, Roosevelt had taken formal steps to change the business of intelligence gathering and spying. This man would play a key role in the shaping of America's Foreign Intelligence Service. William Donovan was the most highly decorated U.S. officer of World War I, where he earned the nickname Wild Bill. He was a very charismatic figure. He wore uniform when I knew him, and he had a lot of merit badges. <laughs> he was, of course, a World War I uh, Congressional Medal of Honor holder. He had piercing, bright eyes. Uh, he looked at you intensely when he talked to you. He seemed to be interested in all of his junior staff. Donovan is considered the father of American intelligence, a man still revered by those who once served under him in a hastily invented World War II intelligence group called the Office of Strategic Services. Veterans of the OSS still convene for annual meetings. At this Washington gathering in 1986, the late CIA director, William Casey, made one of his last public appearances and paid tribute to William Donovan. Fellow survivors, OSS started with a vision of Bill Donovan's, a vision that intelligence, subversion, and psychological warfare could be our spearhead, a critical spearhead, in the invasion of Europe. Prior to World War II, there was no foreign intelligence agency for young Americans like Casey to join. Its creation in 1942, however, was not a popular decision. Everything in the government gets decided by committee. And uh, for two years, Dunham was struggling to get an authorization, get a charter, to get uh, uh, allotment of uh, people uh, through committees that there was always somebody there to block them. Uh, J. Edgar Hoover ob objected to anybody uh, being an intelligence uh, other than himself because he felt that he was much better qualified to conduct a worldwide organization because he already had the FBI in place here in this country. The military, of course, were very resentful of the arrival of this independent organization. Now, in various situations, the military intelligence people particularly resisted it. It was borne in upon me by this experience that today in this country, we are facing one of the most crucial tests of our history. Donovan survived the inter-service rivalry and quickly began building his espionage agency. One of the first places Donovan turned to was here, the Library of Congress, 
not exactly a haven of spies. But for Donovan's brain trust of scholars, this was a gold mine of critical information about the world now engulfed in war. I think the reason we all admire Donovan was that he was such a dedicated, uh, driving man, and that he saw the in brainy side of intelligence. He was not just a spook or a cowboy, though he was fascinated with behind-the-lines operations, and he strongly believed in espionage. But he also believed that the product of intelligence could come from anywhere, open sources, library research, whatever, and that what you wanted was a broad contextual understanding of the uh, international conflicts that were confronting the United States so they could be explained in depth to the men like the president who had to make concrete decisions affecting what the United States would do. Before the OSS, American intelligence, what little there was, had been insular. Now, for the first time, America was taking a critical look at the entire world. But such intelligence gathering was only part of the job of the USS. The other part was much more exciting. Like the British service it was modeled after, the USS also conducted espionage and low-level military operations, as seen in these OSS films. Like many others, Richard Helms was trained in the arts of espionage by a British agent. The man who taught close combat was um, Colonel Fairbairn, and I must say that he had a lot of exotic and very effective means of uh, disposing of people. His uh, thesis was that in wartime, there are no good, and good guys among the enemy, they're just dead guys. And I must say that it was a most startling experience to learn how many ways that you could find to dispose of your uh, fellow man. Donovan's initial plan was for a group of less than 100 agents. Before the war was over, the OSS grew to over 12,000 as agents trained for missions behind enemy lines. One of its first operations took place in the jungles of Burma a nation overrun by the Japanese in 1942. In command of Allied forces was General Joseph Stilwell. We got run out of Burma, and it's humiliating as hell. I think we ought to find out what caused it, go back and retake the place. The retaking of Burma began with a small OSS unit, Detachment 101. Its members parachuted behind enemy lines to undertake a new form of warfare never before fought by Americans. Their mission was to organize and train native tribesmen in guerrilla warfare against the Japanese. OSS headquarters in this area is located... Colonel Carl Eifler, an early OSS recruit, was in charge of the mission. General Stilwell gave us a mission to get into Burma behind the Japanese lines and disrupt communications. Another phase of our mission is to gather intelligence on Japanese movements, equipment, supply, and plans. I uh, took the first unit out of the United States in the history of American warfare to fight behind enemy lines. There was a great deal of, uh, of training went into training the natives themselves. We were looking for individuals that we could train. When we found them, we put them through a school, trained them, physically developed their bodies to where they could take the hardships of, of guerrilla warfare. Without the goodwill of the natives that you are living with and fighting for, guerrilla warfare is useless. We fought a new 
kind of war that had never been fought before. We always fought attack. We struck and we ran. And the result of our activities was that we drove them back and took from them some 15,000 square miles of territory. I just figured that in my day, I broke every law of God and man. And someday I'd pay an answer to it. Not to man, to God. When I was fighting it, no rules. The only rule was win. These scenes, shot by the USS, speak of the brutality of a guerrilla war. A war where often the only rule was to win. This left a legacy, one which would come to haunt U.S. covert actions in later years. I know that uh, people take sides and they're rather vociferous on this subject. But the fact remained that in World War II, the OSS was dedicated to the thing that everybody else was, and that was to win the war. And how you won it was irrelevant, and nobody cared. And I served side by side in the OSS with priests and ministers and lawyers and teachers and professors and so forth, all of them dedicated to the same principles. There was no division about uh, how it was desirable to win or how fast we ought to do it, fast as possible. It was only later that these divisions came up and these issues of whether you should have covert action or not have covert action, whether it was moral or immoral, all of those things are long after the war was over. By D-Day on June 6th, 1944, the OSS had carved out its turf in Allied military operations. Many OSS officers and agents were already in place, far beyond the beachhead. There was a can-do attitude of William Donovan that nourished inside the OSS, a belief that anything that could be thought of might be done. The assassination of Adolf Hitler was one. The kidnapping of Germany's atomic scientists was another. But on this day, as troops fought for a beachhead at Normandy, OSS paramilitary units working with a French resistance operated behind enemy lines. Blowing up bridges. Disrupting communications. And tying up troops away from the battlefield. But here, as in Burma, were omens of trouble for the United States. The secret arts of commando warfare were learned well. In years to come, they would be used without accountability throughout the world. Those were good OSS operations, and they were the, the cowboy type. And uh, Donovan let it all be known that we had done these things. Uh, I, th I think that our successes were real but limited. I do not believe that they succeeded in the uh, clandestine penetration of Germany nearly early enough. I think they did succeed in making contact with behind-the-lines fighters in France and Italy, uh, but they were marginal, if you like, in, in organizing that effort. Uh, I give them high marks for starting from scratch and achieving uh, limited goals. But if you ask, would we have won the war without them, I'd say yes, we would have over a longer period of time. After the Normandy invasion, almost a year of fighting remained in Europe, a time in which the Allies would discover the true horror of Hitler's Third Reich. Many veterans of the OSS would witness such scenes. Here was real evil, evil worth defeating, it seemed, at any cost. By 1945, Germany was conquered and Hitler dead. Russian and American soldiers celebrated. But even then, US leaders, including OSS Commander Donovan, had already begun to regard the Soviet Union with deep suspicion. One totalitarian power was conquered, 
but another seemed to be taking its place. Quietly, OSS and military intelligence officers began preparing for a new struggle. Surrendering Germans were recruited. Some were scientists and engineers who had created Germany's terror weapon, the V-2. This was the world's first ballistic missile, and Hitler had hurled it against Allied cities with devastating effect. The V-2 appeared too late to change the outcome of the war, but in future conflicts, intelligence officers reasoned, the balance might rest with such a weapon. All of the Allies scrambled at war's end to capture Germany's rocket engineers. America got most of them. They were secretly transported to the United States, where they built America's first missiles. In their ranks were Nazis who had helped run the V-2 missile factory and prison where thousands of slave laborers perished. Others had even more grisly pasts, like General Reinhard Gellin, responsible for the torture and murder of countless Allied prisoners of war, and Klaus Barbie, who personally tortured Jews and French resistance fighters and sent thousands to their deaths. Why were the past deeds of these and others ignored? We asked that question of John Weitz, a Jewish refugee from Nazi Germany, who also served in the OSS. And somebody would say, this man knows exactly what's what and who's who. And then somebody else came to them and said, this man is a swine, he's a Nazi. You can't use him. The American officer, nine out of 10 times, was a perfectly nice, somewhat middle-aged lieutenant colonel a reserve officer who wanted to get the heck, the heck back to Oklahoma, to Wisconsin, to, to Illinois, to his job, to his family. And he was not anxious to hang around and find somebody else because this was not a peckable man because this was a swine. So he said, okay, I'll use him. Look, you worry about what he's about later. In the meantime, I, I'll, I'll get what I want out of him, then I'm sure we can get rid of him. That's how Klaus Barbie, I, I'm sure, got recruited. While his officers in the field prepared for a new conflict, Donovan lobbied for a permanent intelligence organization. It would confront the Soviets throughout the world. It was a job G. Edgar Hoover sought as well. Donovan promoted his OSS with an old Hoover trick using the media to build up public support. Quickly, a spate of books, magazine articles, and even comic books appeared, all glorifying the espionage and behind-the-lines missions of Donovan and the OSS. But the media proved part of Donovan's undoing. Someone, many believed it was Hoover, leaked Donovan's confidential proposal to the press. There is the flag draped Whatever chances Donovan had to run America's post-war intelligence agency died with the death of Franklin Roosevelt. Within a month of the war's end, Donovan's OSS was disbanded. The OSS commander was given a handshake instead of a permanent intelligence agency. Hoover and his FBI survived, of course. But the director, too, was denied his dream of heading up an expanded intelligence agency. Truman hated Hoover. Truman distrusted Hoover. Therefore, when it came time to set up post-war worldwide intelligence, Truman rejected Hoover's wishes for the FBI to manage both domestic and foreign intelligence. In fact, Truman used the word Gestapo in describing what the FBI would become if it held responsibilities for both domestic and foreign. Therefore, Hoover harbored a grudge against the CIA, and this lasted for the rest of his career. Harry Truman tried to manage a nation that was now the world's greatest economic and military power without an international intelligence agency. He quickly changed his mind. In the uneasy peace that followed World War II, Truman decided there was a need for secret agents and warriors. The OSS would rise again under the name of the Central Intelligence Agency. 
Many of those who would join the CIA came from the ranks of the OSS, men who witnessed the intelligence disaster of Pearl Harbor and the utter evil of Hitler's Third Reich. But many of these men had learned another lesson as well, one that would leave a disturbing legacy in years to come. The only rule was to win.